So today will be the second half of the respiratory system. Last time we got up through about 21.9. I skipped over the muscles and jumped over to spirometry just so you had a visual of that. How many of you have not received the handout page? Either I gave you a hard copy and I'll give them out in lab tonight. I have some in the lab. And those who are listening in uh, who are in the hybrid section, I will send out an email about this. But in lab this week, we are doing spirometry. And if the hybrid group can arrange to take the exam at 4 o'clock with everyone else, I think it's to their advantage because they will have been through the lab. The lab's not that complicated, but I think some connections will be made in lab that you may be disappointed you don't have if you don't try to take the lab before the exam. So try to do that. It's not the end of the world. That's why I gave you that handout form, and I'll talk about that tonight in lab and on Thursday as well. Uh, get that for me afterwards. It is also posted uh, on Blackboard under this lecture material for respiratory system. So today we're going to be talking about the last little bit of respiratory system. We have an exam on Thursday. It'll be a full-length exam. You'll need a Scantron form. It's going to cover lymphatic, digestive, and respiratory. On mastering, the digestive quiz is due tonight, and the respiratory quiz is due tomorrow night. Lymphatic is past us. And what else is going on in your lives? Lab reports should be coming in tonight and Thursday at lab. Uh, case studies number two, if you haven't looked at those, take a look at them once this test is over. They're going to be due on the 30th of July. That's the last Thursday of class. And just to put this all in perspective, folks, after today's lecture, on Thursday we have an exam. <laughs> then next week we have two lectures, and that's it. Right, we've got lectures on Tuesday and Thursday. The following week, it's finals week. You have only the lab exam on Thursday, or sorry, on Tuesday, and you have only the lecture exam on Thursday or Friday. And that lecture exam will be in the testing center on Thursday or Friday. So more about that in lab, or if you have any questions about the overall scheduling, let me know. But we really are coming down toward the end um, on this. So any questions over... Anything from last time, respiratory system. I spent a lot of time, I went a little bit off script, but I was trying to really get you thinking about the pressures, right? As you increase the thoracic cavity, right? What did Boyle tell us? Pressure and volume are inversely related. So as the thoracic cavity expands, that means the volume is increasing. As volume increasing, pressure goes down. As a result of that, prayer, air under pressure is coming in right to the lungs. Now, what muscles are causing this to happen? So that's where we're heading right now. These muscles were also listed for you in lab for you to know for the lab practical. So respiratory muscles. Go back here. There we go, the beginning of 21.10. Muscles are inspiratory muscles. That is, they're going to cause you to inspire, to expand your thoracic cavity, or they are expiratory muscles, that is, they're going to cause your uh, chest to decrease its volume. Now, primary inspiratory muscles, these are the ones involved in your quiet breathing. Quiet breathing is what you are doing right now. You're just sitting there, you're not scared, uh, you are doing your normal active inhalation. At this point, it does take energy to inhale. Is that a lot? Right? But you are definitely contracting muscles, your diaphragm is contracting, and that is causing you to breathe in. In normal breathing, exhalation is passive. So there is no muscles required, no contraction of muscles required. During normal breathing, exhalation is passive. It only is involving the relaxation of the muscles that have already contracted. 75% of all of normal, quiet breathing is the job of the diaphragm, right? So the diaphragm is doing 75% of the work, and the other 25% is coming from the external intercostals, right? And these muscles are going to be elevating the ribs a little bit. So at normal breathing, you definitely can see the thoracic cavity. You can see the rib cage moving a little bit during normal breathing. Now... There are additional accessory muscles. These are muscles that are going to allow you to breathe in deeper, to take in a bigger breath, to do that inspiratory reserve volume that I'll talk about in a few minutes. These are muscles that are only going to be activated if the body 
is either not getting enough oxygen normally or you voluntarily choose to take in that big old breath to blow out the birthday candle. These muscles include sternocleidomastoid. We know that muscle. The scalenes, remember there are three scalenes on the side, anterior, middle, and posterior. Petrellus minor and the serratus anterior. These muscles are all going to, when activated, cause your thoracic cavity to expand. Scalenes are going to lift up, right, increasing the thoracic cavity. The um, pectoralis minor is going to help expand the thoracic cavity. So where are these muscles? In lab, you're going to be looking at these muscles. You should already be very familiar with all of these. The sternocleidomastoid coming down, of course, from the neck. Remember, it, goes through the, it has a part that goes to the manubrium and a part that goes to the clido, the clavicle, and goes up to the mastoid process. You've got the scalenes, you've got the pec minor and the serratus anterior. Those should all be familiar to you. Those are all accessory muscles. Your primary muscles of regular, quiet breathing, again, diaphragm at 75%, external intercostals at 25%. Pretty straightforward. Those are the muscles that are going to expand the cavity. Here you can see those muscles from the side and get an appreciation of how they're going to either lift up on the first ribs, push out on the rib cage, or pull down even on the thoracic cavity. Okay. Then in addition to the muscles of inspiration, Muscles of expiratory muscles. Now, there are no quiet breathing expiratory muscles. I already told you that. Breathing out is passive. This is why, unfortunately, if you've ever come across someone who has died in their sleep, when you roll them over, you may, may ex they may breathe out one more time because there's no energy involved in breathing out. So there can be some air captured or, or, or escaping there. So quiet breathing is completely passive. There are accessory expiratory muscles. These are the ones that you're going to activate when you're trying to blow out the candle. These are the ones that you're going to activate even in the spirometry testing that you're going to do in lab. When you try to blow out air forcefully, you're going to be squeezing some muscles that you wouldn't normally use. These are going to help push everything back into a smaller compartment. They're going to depress the ribs, decrease the thoracic cavity's volume. Therefore, right, if the volume is decreasing, then the pressure is increasing, that increased pressure is going to push the air up and out through uh, your respiratory system. These include the internal intercostals, the transversus thoracis, the external obliques, the internal obliques, and the rectus abdominis. So let's take a look at these. So again, here they are. They're all, there are no uh, regular ex expiratory muscles. They're all accessory, and they're all going to help squeeze the thoracic cavity into a place. You look at it from the side, and they are all, as you can see, they're all pulling it in and decreasing the thoracic cavity. Even the rectus abdominis, right? Shortening is going to pull down, and that is going to help decrease the, the size of the thoracic cavity. Does that make sense for the muscles? And those muscles are all listed. You need to know them on the SOM SOM model for respiration. helps along in stress. So these accessory muscles are working not in tidal volume. Okay, I'm going to get to that in a second, but tidal volume is what you're doing right now, your normal breathing in and out. That's only the diaphragm and the internal intercostals. That's it. Relaxation, passive. Accessory muscles are the ones you're going to call upon to breathe above and beyond your normal. Okay? These muscles would also be called upon if you had a cold, if you had a respiratory infection because your body would not be getting the oxygen in that it normally needs. So, right, you're going to breathe more, you're going to breathe more rapidly. And if you have an asthma attack, right, have you ever looked at a person having an asthma attack? I mean, their chest is heaving. They are, they're working very, very hard to breathe. So again, under, under, those would be an abnormal condition under which the body would recruit either voluntarily or even involuntarily. Your body would drive that respiration rate up and you would be sucking air as an asthmatic, and you'd be pulling in some of these muscles. Okay, so accessory above and beyond normal tidal volume. Now, the volumes that I'm going to describe right now are things you're going to become familiar with tonight and Thursday in lab, and the spirometry tracing that I gave you 
or will hand out to you or that I posted will help you with the kinds of questions that I need you to be able to answer from this. There are about six or seven different volumes that you'll be using and measuring in lab, and let me review those with you now. Title volume, sometimes VT, sometimes TV. Don't be surprised by the, the, the abbreviation on this. But this is the air that you move in and out at relaxed breathing, typically around 500 milliliters per, per, uh, per breath cycle. Now, keep in mind that these are averages, and they do not represent everyone in the room. Some people will have more, some people will have less. They are just that. They are averages, and typically these averages are represented by that normal 125, um, or what is it, 250-pound, 25-year-old male kind of averages. So women might have slightly smaller numbers. Men would have slightly higher numbers. So inspiratory reserve volume, that's the amount of air you can breathe in above and beyond your normal breath. And then the expiratory reserve volume is the amount of air that you can blow out above and beyond how much you would normally exhale. It's easier to see on a graph. The residual volume is the amount of air that is always left in your lungs, no matter how hard you try and how hard you squeeze to get that air out of your lungs. There will always be some residue behind, some residual volume. And finally, uh, the minimal volume, I did not talk about this one in lab, but this is when you really can't measure in a healthy person, but the amount of air in the lungs if they were allowed to collapse. Uh, minimal volume, tell you what, go ahead and cross that off. I'm not going to be talking about that in lab, and I will not ask a question about it. So let's not confuse the issue. There are some basic equations that you're going to have to put together. And one of them, um, I'm going to jump down to the third one. The functional residual capacity, this is going to be your ERV. And again, these numbers don't make sense when you see the graph. The ERV plus the residual volume. The vital capacity, the second one, is your ERV, your vital, uh, your tidal volume, and your IRV, and we'll see that one in the lab for sure. And then the inspiratory capacity is the tidal volume plus the IRV. Total lung capacity, how much your lung can theoretically hold, is going to be all of your vital capacity plus your residual volume. So let's take a look at this. Let's spend a few minutes looking at this together. If you have your handout, if by chance you have that handout, go ahead and just have it out handy. You might find that by going through this, it makes more sense if you're looking at that as well. So this represents a typical adult male. It tells us here this is adult male. And the first thing I want to point out to you is that on this typical adult male, there is a total lung capacity of about 6,000 milliliters, six liters. So that's the theoretical average or theoretical, at least for this particular patient's, volume that the lung could potentially hold. In the very center, I'm going to scribble on this in a few different places, but there is this little band right here. I probably should use a different color, but this red, up and down, up and down, up and down. That represents the tidal volume. That's your normal breathing in and out, in and out. If you look over here on the side, right, the difference in that wave is about 500 milliliters, and that represents the tidal volume. Then, let's say this is how much you normally breathe out, but there's an amount of air that you can blow out in excess. That air that you can blow out in excess in reserve is your ERV, your expiratory reserve volume. Right, that would be whew, emptying out air well beyond what you normally would blow out. It's not that much, right? I mean, I'll try it yourself. It's not that much volume in the ERV. However, there's a lot more inspiratory reserve volume that one can usually get. That is the amount of air that you can breathe in and above your normal inspiration. And that is usually right, a lot more air than your ERV. So that is your, this, this amount just from here to here, that's your IRV from here to here, and then your ERV down below. Now, if I take those numbers, let me change colors. If I take those numbers and I take the IRV plus the tidal volume plus the ERV, on the graph, that's represented from here down to here. And that represents your vital capacity, your capacity for vital, for life. 
right? That's how much you can actually use your lung. You have inhaled as high as you can. You have exhaled as far as you can. In lab, that will be called the uh, vital capacity, but it might also be called the forced vital capacity. So I want you to add that word. And sometimes you'll see this abbreviated as the FVC or simply the VC. Forced, because in order to get that greatest inspiration and blow out greatly on the great expiration, you must force it. There has to be forceful muscle contraction. So forced vital capacity equals vital capacity, same thing. And you'll see that. That's, those are, so far, that's four things that I want you to see very carefully. So we have the tidal volume. In lab, we'll talk about the ERV and the IRV. When you take all three of those together, that equals the vital capacity. When you blow out, there will always be some air left behind. That air is shown on the bottom of the graph, and it is representing this. I'll put it in green. It's representing this area here, and that is the residual volume. Okay, That's how much is left behind in the lungs, no matter how hard you blow off. We'll talk about that one in lab a little bit. And then um, all of this together, when you take the vital capacity plus the residual volume, that is going to give you your total lung capacity. And that's shown from the very top all the way to the very bottom. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six measurements that I want you to specifically know on this spirograph. Okay? There's one more value that we'll talk about in lab. That's the FEV1. It's not something you can see graphed on this, but these are the six that I want you to know well. The other ones aren't as important. So the functional residual and the um, inspiratory capacity and the minimal volume are not values that I want you to worry about. Okay. So the three that have X's in them, don't worry about those. Just do the six that have stars by them. Now for every individual, they'll have slightly different numbers. So any patient that comes in the clinic would have different numbers. And this is typically done as what's called a pulmonary functions test, a PFT. And a person will coming in with asthma or emphysema or some respiratory disorder, they will go through these tests routinely, and it will help compare their overall function, their respiratory function, from visit to visit. So here are, again, some numbers. In lab, you will each be measuring your own volumes and you'll be comparing those numbers against the expected norm. And your values will be greatly influenced by your age, by your height, and by your sex. Okay, so males, usually more. Um, taller, bigger lungs. Younger, more elasticity, healthier lungs. As you age, right, lungs become a little bit less compliant, a little bit less able to stretch, um, and... Uh, height again, and so you'll, you'll see the relationship of those things. So don't memorize these numbers, right? Just see that they can be rather different, males versus females. Yes? Do any of these um, numbers on the graph, um, are any of them affected by how athletic you are? Are any of these numbers on the graph affected by how athletic you are? Uh, yes and no. The more athletic you are, I mean, if you're used to exercising vigorously, then your muscles of your forced muscles, those accessory muscles, could be more developed, in which case you might be able to blow out a birthday cake further away than close up, right? A person who's healthier usually has more capacity because their muscles are stronger, their lungs are stronger, and they have the ability, those muscles are stronger, so they can push that, that air out more forcefully. So a person who's less athletic, not as fit, may have more difficulty blowing out a birthday cake, right? That's at closer than a person who's more fit. So yes. The other thing is, just like the heart rate goes up with as we age, so does your respiratory rate. How often you breathe, your tidal volume, the number of breaths you take per minute will increase with age. And as we age, the amount of air that you're taking in with each and every breath will decrease. It sounds a lot like the argument about cardiac output and stroke volume and heart rate. It's the same idea, right? So the heart over time becomes less efficient so to the lungs become less efficient. Therefore, to make up the difference, because the brain still needs just as much oxygen as it did when you were healthier, so as a result, the respiratory rate 
rate will go up, just like the heart rate will go up. So it's the same physiological logic as you think through that. Good questions. So that gets us through, um, and I'll go into that, some of that breathing rate right now, but that gets us through the muscles of respiration and the spirometry. Again, the spirometry will be the focus of your lab exercise this week. You will also be quizzed over spirometry next week in lab. So um, my hope is that it's a very, very strong quiz grade because you will already you know, look through these content. Really, all this uh, will be on the test, and so it'll be a, it should be a very nice test for everyone. I'm sorry, nice quiz for next, everyone next week. Okay, so what happens? Stacy just asked, you know, as we get older, as we're, if we're more fit, do these numbers change? Yes, they can. So you can appreciate, just like your cardiac output changes based upon your condition at that moment, the bear's chasing you, your cardiac output goes up. Not only does your cardiac output go up when your bear is chasing you, but your respiration rate goes up, right? And not only are you breathing more often, you are breathing more deeply. So if you're scared, sympathetic, right? Breathe more often, breathe deeper, the muscles are activated. So we're gonna be changing respiration rate. That is the number of breaths per minute. Average, eh, 12 to 18 breaths per minute. That means you are breathing how often? 12 would be every five seconds, right? Five times 12 is 60, right? So 12 uh, breaths per minute would be every five seconds. 18 breaths a minute would be every roughly three and a half or so seconds, right? So we're all kind of breathing in at rest, somewhere between every three and a half to five seconds. Some people have a slower breathing rate. Some people have a faster uh, respiratory rate. Children are higher, right? Why would that be? They're smaller, right? Their brain, though, is still developing. So their brain and their tissues still need all the oxygen, but they have smaller lungs. Therefore, they're going to breathe more often and not as deeply because their lungs and their muscles aren't as well established. The second thing um, that will vary will be the tidal volume. That is how much air you are moving in and out with each breath, equivalent to stroke volume. Right? Do you agree? Stroke volume and tidal volume, similar. And respira respiration rate and heart rate, similar in your logical and, uh, thinking. So here is just a graphic representation of tidal volume. And you'll be doing this with iWorks in lab. You'll be hooking up your client, your, your guinea pig this week, and you'll be breathing in and out, in and out. And here we see that the tidal volume is roughly 500 milliliters per breath. And we see that a breath cycle took four seconds, right? Do we see that four seconds across the bottom? So how many breaths is this person taking a minute? Every four seconds, 60 divided by four is and always has been 15, right? So our respiration rate would be about 15, okay? See where I got that number from? Okay. So what are the numbers? V E, V sub E is referring to the volume of air every minute. Volume of air every minute. It sounds a lot like cardiac output. Okay, it's the same concept. So for your logic, if you just think, okay, this is really, really similar to cardiac output. And what is V sub E? It is the frequency, in other words, heart rate, times stroke, or times, times vital capacity, stroke volume. Okay, so it's really just the, the equivalent conversation. So how often you're breathing times how much you're breathing with each and every breath. At rest, on average, about, six liters per minute. So let's put, it, let's put that into math. Um, if someone is, has a VE of six liters per minute and each, volume, each time they breathe in and out, they're breathing in, uh, we'll make it easy, 500 mils, right? That is their vital capacity. What must their frequency of breathing be? What's their respiration rate?
Is that too messy? That's really the equation, isn't it? Okay. So what's x equal to? 12, right? 12 times 5 is 60, right? So that means, on average, again, about 12 breaths per minute, each breath, about 500 mils of air per breath, would give you a total V sub E of about 6,000 milliliters per minute or 6 liters per minute. If you're scared, what's going to happen? It's going to go up. What's going to go up? Not only are the number of breaths per minute going to go up, but also if you're scared, the depth of your breathing will increase. Same idea. If you're scared, not only will your heart rate go up, but your heart will beat more forcefully. So same exact idea. So here's the equation. Put it together. Oh, look. There's the exact one I gave you. Not very creative, was I? Yes. 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 No, I don't want you to ignore it. What I want you to do is 6,000. Most of the books, again, will show 6,000 on a chart. That is a reasonable number to have in mind. It's a nice round number. It's easy to remember. Just know that that's usually for guys. Gals are going to be less. Some guys would be more. On the spirometry problem that I has passed out and what will be on the test, you'll actually read the graph. So it may not be a 6,000 maximum. It may be only 5,000 or 4,000 because every individual person would have a different number. So I would give you the graph and you would just look at it. So don't worry about memorizing numbers. Ranges, yeah, have a sense of it, but don't memorize numbers because male, female, and every patient is different. No. When I ask if the numbers were male or female, no. Because it could be a little dude. <laughs> right? Or it could be some Olympic, you know, bench-pressing freak woman. So, yeah, no, you can't, you can't tell that. Did you guys see the Pan Am games? Did you see the woman, the, the body, the lifter? She made me look petite. She was quite the woman. Anyway. <laughs> But she's got a gold medal around her neck, so yeah, good for her. Okay, so what do we have here? Breathing rate, your respiratory rate, times the stroke, or the tidal volume is going to equal the minute volume, the respiratory minute volume, and the abbreviation for that again was V sub E. Let me get that to write on there. So this is that V sub E. Did we kill that one adequately, that concept? Okay. Okay, so other thing now, we've got, we're talking about V sub E. That is the overall breathing rate, yes, per minute, total lungs. Now we've also got to deal with alveolar ventilation. In other words, yes, you're breathing in and out, but really what matters is how much of that air actually gets down to the alveoli. Because it's in the alveoli where the gas exchange is happening. There is an anatomic dead space. Okay? So V sub A is the amount of air that's reaching your alveoli per minute. It is going to be much less than your respiratory minute volume because there's some air that will never get all the way down to your alveoli. Again, this is that anatomic dead space, V sub D. It's going to be somewhere around 150 mils. So if you think about this, what I'm saying is, if I breathe in 500 mils with every normal breath, right, tidal volume, but 150 mils of that is stuck in my trachea, primary bronchi, and down my bronchial tree, how much air actually got down to my alveoli? Only 350. So the average person, again, taller person, me, I'm going to have a bigger, longer dead space than a shorter person. But on average, that dead space at 150 mils. That's that conducting zone. This is why, well, have you ever thought about it? Would you ever want to jump into the deep end of a pool? 
and breathe through a 50-foot garden hose. Every 10-year-old boy thinks about this, right? <laughs> All right, let me just jump in the bottom of the pool and play hide-and-go-seek, and I'll grab the hose. What's going to happen very, very quickly? If you're only breathing in and out 500 mils, I'm going to guess that that hose contains much more than 500 mils of air up and down. So you're sitting there breathing in the 10-foot in the end of the pool, but you're not getting any fresh air, are you? If you're going to jump in the pool and breathe through a straw, you better be really close to the surface and have a very short straw, right? Does that make sense? So if you're only blowing in and out 500 mils with your normal breathing, that long old hose isn't going to work. Now, if you're, a scuba, if you're, not, if you're a snorkeling, right, how long is that snorkel? Much less, right? So even a long snorkel is, is going to be short enough that you can breathe beyond the volume that's held within that snorkel. Do you also agree that the air that reaches your alveoli is a mix of both oxygenated air and air that has been partially exhaled? So as you breathe in, right, the air, I'm getting, bringing air in, only some of it's getting to my alveoli, and there was already some air that was being exhaled beforehand, so the air that actually gets down to my alveoli is not quote, freshly oxygenated air, it's not the freshest air, it's a little bit compromised, isn't it? So you've got less volume and compromised air coming back into the lungs. So as a result of that, we need to kind of think about this whole situation. So as you're breathing out, this is just a simple representation of, an, of the lung. Here, though, what we're seeing is one alveolus, like one big sphere Imagine now you've got 300 or 400 million of these little spheres representing the entire lung. But in these simple schematics, we have just the air of one alveolus, but think of it as all the air in the lung. And again, as you're blowing in and out, there's going to be that anatomic dead space of air that's stuck in the conducting zone. So we want to think now about the alveolar ventilation. It is the number of breaths that you breathe per minute times the volume of air that actually gets to the alveoli. That is, what is our normal tidal volume? 500. I told you the normal anatomic dead space was 150. So that's what this equals right there, right? So that means that V sub A is the number of times you breathe per minute times 350 mils per breath, roughly. So whereas normally you would get a um, 6,000 for that, right? We're talking about 12 times a minute, 500 uh, mils per each time. Here you're only getting 350 mils. So small changes in tidal volume can have a rather large effect on how well the alveoli are doing. When your demand for oxygen increases, exercise. Right? Not only are you going to breathe faster, but again, you're going to increase the tidal volume as well. So taking a look at this then, V sub A is only about 3 liters per minute. Now, what is that assuming? Here, that's assuming 20 breaths per minute and 150 mils per, uh, per breath. This is different, right? I got my 6 liters per minute up here, but look how I got there. A person who's only breathing in and out 300 mils each and every time, but they're breathing in and out 20 times a minute. So that would be a small child, right? A small a child would breathe more often and would have a smaller rate, but still their V sub E would be closer to 6,000, just like an adult. So just appreciate that particular idea of V sub A, alveolar uh, ventilation. Questions? Conceptually, can you picture it? Don't try to memorize this stuff, but just, just picture it. So V sub A is the amount of air that gets to your alveoli. V sub E is the amount of air that comes into your entire system per minute. I've already introduced to you Boyle. What did Dr. Boyle say? That pressure and volume are inversely related. There are a couple other guys who dealt with gases and their uh, names are associated with these laws. 
Another one is Dalton's Law and Henry's Law. And somewhere in here, I'm going to have Charles's Law, too. Um, so that's going to be, so we're going to have four, four guys to keep up with. And if it doesn't, it will. Okay. Are you saying it's not coming up? Don't remember it? Yeah, okay. So let me to mention Charles' effect right now, okay? Because um, I may not have it in the notes. Charles' Law. Charles' Law is the one I stepped into last, thir last Tuesday, uh, last Thursday. Temperature effects, okay? So Charles said this. Remember I, I started, I walked down this road wrongly. Um, we talked about boil. That was pressure and volume being inverse related. We kind of get that story. Charles said, in whatever year that was, that volume and temperature are affected. So if I have a balloon and I blow that balloon up and I bring that balloon out into a cold place, what happens to that balloon? The pressure goes, I mean, the, everything goes down, right, in the lower temperature. In a warmer temperature, that balloon will expand more forcefully. Your tires do this in the winter time. Your tires go a little bit more flat. They expand a little bit more in the heat. Uh, so that's Charles's law, and that's important as you think about the overall function of the respiratory system. Remember that with each and every breath, the air is being warmed and humidified as it comes into your lungs. Why is it important that Charles's law, thinking about Charles's law, and then why is it important that the air that reaches your alveoli should be at body temperature? What would happen if the, the air that reached your little alveoli, these little tiny spheres, these little balloons, what if the air that reached those alveoli was, a, was appreciably warmer? Then those alveoli would be expanding, wouldn't they? And what if instead the air going into them was very much colder? They would shrink. This is why when you step out into the winter and it's a really, really cold day, that first breath is like, <gasps> right? It's almost like the breath is taken away from you because your body did not have a chance to warm that air up. There's kind of a shock effect, and that cold air rushing in did what? Literally shrunk your little alveoli, reducing the surface area, making it more difficult to get a breath. Now your body will adjust to that, and same way walking into a hot sauna. You walk into a hot sauna, that first breath can be a little bit more difficult because, again, you know, those alveoli were affected dramatically by the temperature. So that's Charles's law, okay? So we got Boyle. We got Charles. Now, let's go into the other ones. Um, and this has to do with Dalton's Law, where I'm heading next. Dalton's Law deals with the pressure of the gases at atmospheric, at, at, at um, sea level. At sea level, there is 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure in the atmosphere. That's a lot. When you go to pump up a blood pressure cuff, how much do you pump it up to? 180 or 200 millimeters of mercury, right? That's a lot of pressure on your arm. We have 760 millimeters of mercury pushing on us from the atmosphere all the time. We're completely benign to it. We don't even know that it's there because we're so accustomed to it. Our entire musculature has to develop and work against that 760 millimeters of mercury. As you climb to a higher altitude, that pressure decreases. If you were to go to Death Valley, that pressure would be a little bit higher as you go deeper down toward the center of the Earth. So that is 760 millimeters of mercury. Now, where is that pressure coming from? It's coming from the collective gases in the atmosphere. And Dalton described this. So if there's 760 millimeters of mercury in our atmosphere, that means that that pressure is coming in part from the nitrogen in the air, from the oxygen in the air, from the helium, and from the other gases that are naturally occurring in our atmosphere. It's pretty simple. Um, the total 760 millimeters of mercury is absolutely related to the percentage of each gas in the atmosphere. So the rule of thumb is, in, in, in the atmosphere, 20.9%. That is the percent of our atmosphere composed of oxygen gas. When we breathe in, we actually breathe in far more nitrogen than we do oxygen. 
but our body doesn't use that nitrogen. That nitrogen is, a, is an inert gas to our bodies. We don't use it. All we really care about when we breathe in is O2, 21%, 20.9%. Now, when you go to Denver, the atmosphere there still has 20.9% oxygen. But what has decreased is the pressure. So there's a, maybe a slightly less amount. But basically, the rule of thumb is there's just as much oxygen in the air in Denver as there is here. The difference is the overall pressure. Now, what really changes here, what really changes here, think about this, and then I'll come back to it. But as you breathe in, this is what's in the air, 20.9%. But what percent of that actually gets to the alveoli? 13.2%. Okay, it drops rather significantly. And when you exhale air, it's only 15% oxygen. So we bring in 20%, 21%, and we blow off 15%, and the alveoli are only getting even less than that, aren't they? Remember, it's a mixed compromised air cycle that's going into the alveoli. So the alveoli are getting even less. Carbon dioxide, it's not a big player in our atmosphere. Only about 0.3% of the atmosphere is CO2. When we blow off, though, do you, we all appreciate, we're making CO2 as a waste product. So when we blow off our air, there's a lot more CO2, 3.7%. That's, that's a lot more, right? It's a lot more. That's 10 times more, 100 times more, right, CO2 that we're blowing off. Vapor, right, water vapor. There's certainly water in the atmosphere, and the atmosphere we, bl we bring, bring in, normal, would be somewhere around 3.7%. And when we blow air out, we're blowing off steam, aren't we, in a way? We're blowing off moisture. So we do lose moisture through our respiratory system. And you see here that there's a 10, 12% or 10 or 12 fold more water that we exhale out. Okay, so what we're seeing here, what this says up here is this that at sea level, the atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. And where do we get those numbers? Well, 597 of those 760 are coming from nitrogen. Where's that number coming from? 597 is simply 78.6% of 760. So the collective pressures of all, the nitrogen, the oxygen, the CO2, and the water vapor are going to add up to be 760. You're not going to have to calculate this, right? Just appreciate that Dalton's law says that each gas is providing a partial pressure. So that's Dalton. Then there's Henry. Okay, so we've got Boyle, Charles, Dalton, and now we've got Henry. Henry says this, at a given temperature, the amount of a particular gas is directly proportional to that partial pressure. This one's a little bit more difficult to get your head around, I think. So here is an example of this. Now, we've all opened up a soda can, and we know that in there, uh, it's under pressure. So soda is put into a can under pressure. The gas is in there at equilibrium, right? The gas is bouncing around within that can before you open it. When you open it, right, you're suddenly releasing CO2. What did, what did Henry say again? At any given temperature, the amount of a gas is proportional to the partial pressure. Now, what happens to the pressure of that gas as you increase the temperature of a soda can? Have you ever had a soda can explode in your car? Right? Have you ever had that happen? Okay, it's not fun, right? You, you don't leave dogs or children or soda in the car in the summer because dogs and children die and, and Coke explodes. Right? And you'll have coke all over the place because that pressure will increase and you'll have, you know, the, the, the cap will pop on your pop and you'll have a big old mess in the car. So don't leave the dogs, the children, or the soda in the back seat on a hot day. Okay, there's a couple numbers here. We've got to get these numbers down. And I'll show you some graphs on this as well. Oxygen moves in and out of your alveoli and into your blood 
based upon diffusion. What is diffusion all about? Diffusion is the movement of something because of a concentration gradient, right? Um, here, we're going to be talking about pressure gradients. Pressure and concentration, close enough for our mind. But here we're going to be using numbers of pressure. In external respiration, as you breathe, oxygen content in arriving deoxygenated blood, the PO2, that is the pressure of the oxygen, is 40 millimeters of mercury. In the alveoli, it's 100. So what does this tell us? There's more oxygen in the alveolus than there is in the deoxygenated blood passing through the lungs. So which way is oxygen going to go? From the alveolus into the deoxygenated blood. So now that blood just turned from being blue to being red. CO2 is the opposite. Carbon dioxide, if you're imagining you're a little red blood cell and you are coming into the lung, you just come back from your big toe, your blue blood, right? And as that blue blood comes back toward the lung, that blood has 45 millimeters of mercury of PCO2, the pressure of CO2, of carbon dioxide. In the alveolus, it's only 40. So which way is CO2 going to go? CO2 is going to jump out. It's going to jump from the blood and jump out into the alveolus, and then we'll blow off that CO2. So we see that it's these pressures. Okay, I know when you think about diffusion, you think about concentration. But Dalton told us what? The pressure of the gas is proportional to the amount, right? So the, the pressure and the amount here, the concentration are, you can think of them as being similar. So here are the numbers. Put your mental cap on, your little magic school bus ride. You are riding a little red blood cell. That blood cell is coming back from the body. It's coming into <laughs> the lungs. It has just left the right heart. Right? The right heart received that blue blood, pumped it over to the lungs. When that blood arrives, it is going to have in it about 40 millimeters of mercury of oxygen and about 45 millimeters of mercury of CO2. The air you breathe in from the atmosphere, by the time it gets down to your alveoli, to the little air sacs, is going to have 100 millimeters of mercury of oxygen and about 40 millimeters of CO2. So, as we just said in words, what's going to happen? Things are going to go in their independent concentration gradients, in their pressure gradients. These are not interacting with each other. The movement of oxygen is not dependent upon CO2. The movement of CO2 is not dependent on oxygen. So they're moving independent of each other. So as the arrows show us, oxygen's going from 100, going to where it's only 40. It's going in, isn't it? We're going to reoxygenate that blood, and the blood's going to become nice, bright red. The CO2 is going to leave because there's more of it in the blood coming in than there is in the air, so CO2 is going to hop out. Now, after that exchange happens, what's the state of the blood leaving the alveoli? That is, what's the state of the blood that's about to go back to the left side of the heart and get pumped off to your body tissues and your systemic circuit. At that point, PCO, or PO2 of 100 and the PCO2 is 40. In other words, the alveolus and the gas of the blood are the same, right? Do you see that? So you've just re-energized. You've just re-normalized. You've re-equilibrated the blood, leaving the alveolus, or sorry, leaving the alveolus and heading back toward the heart. Now, by the time that blood gets to your tissues, it's dropped a little bit. So by the time that oxygen arrives at your tissues, it has dropped down to 95. Why? It was 100. Right? It was about 100 when it left the lung. It's dropped down to 95 because that blood is going to mix a little bit with some venous blood. In your interstitial fluid, your, PO, your PCO2, sorry, your PO2 is 40. 
So again, which way is it going to go? Now we're down at the tissues. We're down at your big toe. You're, we're in your brain. You're bringing 95 millimeters of mercury of oxygen in the blood. The tissues, the interstitial tissues, interstitial tissues only sitting at 40. Which way is oxygen going to go? Toward the tissue, right? So that's oxygen being dropped off at your tissues. Also at the tissues, CO2, what arrived was 40. Your tissues are going to have 45. We've already been here once in a way. And now what's going to happen? CO2 is going to leave the interstitial fluid around the cells and jump a ride into the blood and come back. So that's shown here. Blood coming into your tissues, arterial blood, 95 and 40. Your tissues, this is again normal sitting there, resting metabolism, are going to have numbers of 40 and 45 respectively. And as you see now, the oxygen is going to go into the tissues, the CO2 is going to come out of the tissues. Now look at the state of the blood. The state of the blood now looks like the interstitial fluid, right? The fluid leaving the tissues is now 40 and 45, which matches the condition of the tissues. So those numbers we have to know. You've got to know those numbers. Those are normal numbers, and everything we'll be talking about is based around those numbers. So make sure you know the 40, the 45. Now, circle this. Sorry. Circle this 40 and 45 and go back four slides. Look, right, that 40 and 45, that's the same thing. Do you see that? Okay, so how far, how many slides do we go back? Two. So the 40 and 45, right, representing the blue blood, see that's the same situation. So now you got to kind of in your mind make this a one big cycle, right? Blood in, blood out, alveoli, and in the capillaries of your tissues. Question? Um, about like pressure and like breathing and stuff. Yes. Um, when people do like deep like sea diving, what causes them to die like if they come up too yep. fast? So as you come up, the pressure differences are going to cause oxygen to be under that high pressure to be pushed into the blood cells. Okay? The oxygen's being moved into that high pressure. And what do we have more of? Nitrogen. Okay? And so what happens is that um, the, the bends, the nitrogen gas actually becomes a problem. It's being pushed into the blood, and the brain doesn't deal with nitrogen. So basically, you're starving in a way the body of the oxygen under that high pressure. So you've got to come up slowly enough so the body can adjust to that. Okay. So if the, there's more nitrogen than anything in the air, mm -hmm. does the nitrogen diffuse across? And... Not normally. Okay. Nitrogen so is really not a major player at all. It's inert. It really doesn't. In other words, nitrogen doesn't jump a ride on hemoglobin. Well, is oxygen a does. Gradient between? It's not the concentration. It just isn't. It's just not an issue um, because there's no place for that nitrogen to go. It doesn't attach to the hemoglobin. Um, but nitrogen, because it really doesn't affect our physiology, it doesn't even get mentioned in this conversation. All we're really worried about is the oxygen CO2 story. Okay, so let's talk about this. Let's put these numbers into play. A couple more numbers. I know some of you don't like numbers. Each 100 mils of blood leaving the alveoli carries about 20 mils of oxygen. Okay. That's quite a bit, right? That's quite a bit of oxygen that's dissolved in the blood. Only... 0.3 mils of it, or 1.5%, is actually dissolved. The other is bound to hemoglobin. It's kind of what you were saying, Stacy. The nitrogen just doesn't bind to hemoglobin. So the oxygen that we're carrying through our blood, 98.5% of it, the vast majority of it, is bound to hemoglobin. Only a small smidgen of it is actually, quote, dissolved, just kind of hanging out in the blood on its own. And we know hemoglobin, right? We know hemoglobin has four parts to it. You remember this? And each of those has in the center of it a heme group. And that heme group has a, at its center an iron ion. 
and it's to that iron ion, that Fe ion, that the oxygen actually binds. When oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, we call it oxyhemoglobin, right? It has oxygen, it has oxy on it. It's bound and fully oxygenated. Now, here's the problem. Every winter, we hear about people who die of asphyxiation from carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon dioxide does bind to oxygen, it does bind to hemoglobin, okay? But listen carefully, the CO2 does not bind in the same place as the oxygen. In other words, CO2 and oxygen are not competing for the same binding site. But carbon monoxide does bind to hemoglobin in the same place that oxygen does. So if there's too much carbon monoxide, and what's the problem with that gas? It is colorless, odorless, right? You don't know it's around. But that carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin, and it displaces the oxygen. Therefore, oxygen can't bind. So if you're in a room with too much CO, carbon monoxide, you will slowly become very faint, black out, and shortly thereafter die because your brain is not getting the oxygen. The only way to save yourself is to get out of that area, get into some fresh air if it's not too late. Okay, so that's what happens with, with in people burning crazy things inside. Um, even old cars, the exhaust out of a car has a lot of carbon monoxide in it. People you know, commit suicide by putting a tube of that exhaust into their car and breathing that carbon monoxide. But it can also happen accidentally. Um, kids have been known to be in the back of old pickup trucks or old cars, and there's enough of that exhaust leaking up, and kids have been known to die in the back of a seat unknowingly, or be exposed to high amounts of CO completely accidentally by an old leaky, you know, uh, uh, ventilation system. So carbon monoxide poisoning, is that where, um, if you get to a certain point, they can put you in that chamber? Yeah, they can put you in a, hydro, in a hyperbaric chamber. Hyperbaric, higher pressure. So it is possible to put you into a chamber to sort of saturate your body with more oxygen, right? To, in that situation, to try to push the oxygen into your blood and displace that carbon monoxide, and you can do that under higher pressure. Same thing with the uh, bends, right? A person who has had come up too quickly, they'll put them in a hyperbaric chamber. That hyperpressure is going to help try to push that oxygen in and displace that nitrogen. The nitrogen usually doesn't do anything to our red blood cells, except under high pressure when you're coming up too quickly from a, from a scuba trip. So here is just a cartoon of a hemoglobin. Remember that hemoglobin is a four-part protein. There's a part here, a part here, a part here, and a part here. Two of those have the name alpha. Two of those have the name beta. In the very center of it is that heme group and the little red dot in the very center of the heme group is, in fact, the iron ion. So I'm going to show you a graph. This is called an oxygen hemoglobin saturation curve. What it's going to show is the percent of saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen. How many oxygens can bind to one hemoglobin molecule? Four. If all four oxygens are bound to the hemoglobin, then we would say that the, it, it's 100% saturated. If only two oxygens are bound, then we're going to say that instead it's only 50% saturated. Okay? One would be 25, none of them would be zero. With that in mind, when oxygen and uh, hemoglobin are interacting, you're going to get basically an S-shaped curve. And I'll show this to you. Now, hemoglobin is typically more than 90% saturated when the PO2 is above 60 millimeters of mercury. Just keep that in mind for just a second. So let me give you some numbers, and we'll look at this on the graph. At a PO2 of 95 millimeters of mercury, do you agree that was normal? Remember I told you that... The, the oxygen that is reaching your tissues had a pressure of 95 millimeters of mercury. 
95 millimeters of mercury means that hemoglobin is 97% saturated, right? So it's going to be burning bright red. This is going to be bright red blood. The, the higher the saturation, the brighter the color of the blood. Then when the blood is leaving your tissues, we've already dropped off the oxygen, what did I tell you the numbers were? 40. So at 40 millimeters of mercury, hemoglobin is still 75% saturated. What does that tell us? That as your blood, bright red blood, goes to your tissues and drops off oxygen and then leaves the tissues, of those four oxygens that were delivered, how many are we dropping off of the tissues? One. Because there's still 75% saturation when the blood leaves. Now, 75 saturation, we call that blood venous blood. It has that bluish, not a blue tinge, but it has that darker browny red tinge that we say is blue blood, venous blood. From a practical standpoint, prove this to me. What could you do right now, Tony, to prove that this is true? That as, you leave, as blood leaves your tissues, it still has three oxygens bound to it. Prove it to me, somebody. Hold your breath. How long can you hold your breath? Two, three minutes, easily, right? Well, not easily, but it can be done. How long does it take for your blood to circulate through your body? On rough numbers, you have six liters of blood in your body, and your cardiac output is about six liters per minute. So roughly, it takes one minute for all of your red blood cells to make their way around your tissues in a rough sort kind of way of estimating. If after I've gone around, I still have three, hemo or three oxygens left, and I'm not breathing, that means now the blood going out my left ventricle the second time around will only have three. It'll drop off one more and come back and have two. Another minute, go around, have one. Right? You've got, I mean, you've got two or three minutes of oxygen in you under extreme circumstances to maintain life, right? Before you'll faint or, or and hopefully, right, before you breathe again and you're above water. That makes sense? So let's look at this in a graph. Okay, we made kind of a, of, a, of a story out of this. So that means that even in, this is the key, even in venous blood, there's still a lot of oxygen. Don't think that blue blood is oxygen-free blood. It just simply is reduced. Now, in at PO2 of 20 millimeters of mercury, it drops to 20% saturated. What we're going to see is that that little drop from 40 to 20 has a huge effect on this saturation curve. So let's take a look at this curve. Okay, let's put this together. I told you that at 95 millimeters of mercury, do you agree that is the pressure in, the, in arterial blood arriving at your tissues. And I told you that, boy, up there, 97% saturated. It almost looks like 100, right? But right at the very top, almost totally saturated. And then as blood leaves your tissues, it's at 40. We go up. That's actually 75%. Now, active muscle tissue Tell me about active muscle tissue. What does it demand? If you're exercising or your muscles are actively contracting, what must they have? More oxygen to make more ATP to do the sliding filaments, right? So in active muscle tissue, the pressure of oxygen actually is down to 20. What does that tell us? Only 20% of the hemoglobin is saturated. Turn that around. If the hemoglobin is only 20% saturated, what does it tell us? That it is largely free of oxygen. Where did the oxygen go? It jumped off to provide help to the muscle tissue. So saturation, right? The higher the saturation, 
the more oxygen bound to the hemoglobin, the less oxygen that's in the tissues. The lower the saturation, that means that more oxygen has jumped off and is available to the body in that tissue. So this graph is, a, is an important one. This is, again, that hemoglobin uh, pressure graph. Very important one. Now, sorry, what's going to affect the ability of oxygen and hemoglobin to bind? Now, oxygen binds rather weakly as it is, right? If, if, if hemoglobin had an, a really tight grip on the oxygens, that means that the oxygen would have a difficult time, quote, jumping off. So we know just from, you got to picture this, the oxygen is barely attached to the hemoglobin. It's a very weak, if you want to think of a weak magnet, that's okay. But each hemoglobin can handle four little oxygens. There's a weak, quote, magnetic attraction between them. That means that that oxygen can more easily peel off, right, and jump off into your tissues. What's going to affect this? And there was another guy named Bohr. So that's our fifth guy, right? We've got... Boyle, Charles, Henry, Dalton, and now Bohr. Okay, five dead white guys. Now, what Bohr said is that there's a pH effect on your tissue's affinity for blood and hemoglobin. Let's make sense of this. Read what this says. If the pH decreases, the saturation curve shifts to the right. Don't even think about the graph for a second. If your pH levels are decreasing in your tissues, what's going on? It's more acidic. That means you have more CO2. If your tissues have more CO2, what would your tissues be demanding? More oxygen. So as the pH goes down, more oxygen will jump up. Right? Because basically your body needs it. If your body's becoming more acidic, if your tissues in a very localized area are becoming more acidic, then your body will drop off more oxygen to help meet that need. So we'll see what that means here in a second as far as this thing shifting to the left or right. If instead your pH is increasing, that is you're becoming more alkaline, more basic, then the saturation curve shifts to the left. Basically, what does that mean? If your pH is going up, that means you already have plenty of oxygen, so why deliver it? Right? If there, there's already more there. There's no reason to deliver it. Your body has plenty. So we're going to see that the hemoglobin and the oxygen jump on and off each other based upon the body's needs. So not one oxygen has to jump off every time, right? Not it necessarily. Be, not necessarily. Yeah, so, what, so she's asking, does one oxygen have to jump off the hemoglobin every time it goes to your tissues? No. If that tissue were already well oxygenated, then no. The hemoglobin's going to say, eh, you don't need it. I'm going to hold on to it. If it were actively working muscle, what happens when muscle's working? Lactic acid is released. It becomes more acidic. What's Bohr say? Bohr says if the tissue is already acidic, then the hemoglobin is going to drop off more oxygen, maybe more than one, maybe two. And what did we say? At 20, milli 20 millimeters of mercury, active muscle tissue was only 20% or so saturated, which means it's dropping off three. You with me? Yeah. Okay. So we've got this temperature effect. There's also an effect of, or sorry, we've got pH effect. There's also an effect of temperature. It kind of makes sense. If your body temperature is higher, what are you probably doing? Let's just think simple exercising. So if your muscles are warmer, if you're exercising, then they also are going to be demanding more oxygen. Okay? And then finally, there is a molecule, a compound, 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, uh, BPG. And this molecule is... Um, generated from glycolysis in red blood cells. And what it does is more BPG leads to the release of more oxygen. So as BPG production declines, 
as red blood cells age. So as red blood cells get older, what does it tell us? Remember, they live for about 120 days. They float around. As they get older, their amount of BPG goes down. And what's going to happen? They're not as good at carrying oxygen. So at some point, not only do red blood cells kind of get old and ragged, they actually kind of get worn out. They're no longer doing their job because their levels of BPG will drop. They actually test some blood for BPG in the blood bank because you don't want to receive blood that is low in BPG because what's it going to be? It's not effective in doing its job. So this is one of the clinical markers for in transfusions. Let's take a look at this curve. This curve is the same one I just showed you a moment ago. It has that S-curve shape to it. Um, on the side, we've got the percent saturation. Down here, we've got pressure of oxygen. What were the numbers before? Remember at 95 millimeters of mercury, we had about 97% saturation, okay? And then at 40 millimeters of mercury, we had about 75. Okay, so that's that same curve. Now, look what happens if I change the pH, the Bohr effect. And it, it told, what did, what, go back, what did it say? In a lower pH, the graph shifts to the right. What that tells you is this. At a lower pH, it's, we're going to go to the lower line. The pH has dropped down to 7.2. You're not in horrible trouble yet, right? We can handle that kind of fluctuation. But what does that mean to you? If your pH is dropping, that means that CO2 is accumulating. And what does your body want to naturally do? Get rid of that CO2 and replace it with life-giving oxygen. So there's a shift to the right. Look what happens. Okay, you see what just happened? So under normal situations, the oxygen would be 75% saturated. But look what happened when the pH dropped to 7.2. Go up, and now we're somewhere closer to 60% saturated. What just happened? Because there was more CO2, Bohr said, and it's true, that the hemoglobin will now drop off more oxygen. It's leaving the tissues not at 75% saturated, but at around 60% saturated, meaning that it dropped off more than one, right, between one and two oxygens. Um, with temperature and pH, um, I guess it do with the protein on red when it gets too high and then it can no it, longer it, hold anything? It does. Uh, question is, does the pH affect here anything to do with the, with the denaturation, the unraveling of proteins? A little bit. Um, at 7.2, proteins in your body are, are still acting okay, right? Now, if we get down below 6.9 or so, mm -hmm. then we're really, I mean, it's only that half pH difference. That half pH difference is very substantial. So, yeah, proteins will start really, truly having huge issues, not only with pH but with temperature. Now, look what happens if instead... You were asking this earlier. What if instead your pH is actually higher? That's the red line on the top. pH higher tells me what? That your body already has low CO2 or plenty of oxygen. Therefore, I'm not going to drop it off. I'm going to be a little bit stingier. So you're going to stay above 80%, almost 90% saturation. You're just not going to drop off the oxygen when you don't need it. So that's pH. Here's temperature. It's the same shift. Lower pH or higher temperature. Again, what were my numbers? At 40, kind of keep this as your reference. At 40 millimeters, sorry, at 40 millimeters of mercury, what did we say? 75%, right? So we're about that range, body temperature around 38 degrees Celsius. Remember, your blood's about one degree warmer than your body temperature. Body temperature's around 37 Celsius, your blood's around 38 Celsius. So there's your normal body temperature. When it's warmer, 43 degrees, right? Well over 100 degrees, then what's going to happen? You're going to drop off more 
oxygen. The saturation drops. If instead the body was cooler, then you're not going to drop off the oxygen. Does that make sense? This saturation curve, it, it's a beautiful thing, but you've got to plug in numbers, if you will, at this 40, because this is what it's all about. You agree the 40 is what it's all about? Because the 40 was the amount of oxygen in the tissues as blood came by your tissues. And what we're talking about here is how easily or how stingy the hemoglobin is in delivering that oxygen based upon pH changes and based upon temperature changes. I'm going to pause there just for a second. Let's think about it. Any problems? What does, okay, so what's the pressure of oxygen normally coming down to your tissues? Freshly oxygenated, delivering blood is coming in at around 95 millimeters of mercury. At 95 millis, millimeters of mercury, the blood is what saturation of hemoglobin, of oxygen? 97, essentially 100, but really high. Then, after it drops off that oxygen, it's typically around 40 millimeters of mercury. And at 40 millimeters of mercury, under normal physiological conditions, blood pH 7.4, body temperature 38, then the saturation curve will be where? 75%. But if, for some reason, the temperature is higher or this pH is lower, then there'll be a shift to the right, meaning that it'll more easily drop off the oxygen. Okay? If instead the body was cooler or the pH was higher, then we see the curve shift the other way and it is more stingy and doesn't drop the oxygen off. Does that follow? A little mental cartwheel. Yes? So are these pressure numbers going to always be the same then? For our purposes, yes. Okay, so what, are, what do we do in this class? In this class, we learn normal. All right, we learn the normal numbers. This is not a pathophysiology class. We'll throw a couple diseases in once in a while to make it interesting. But what we're trying to learn are what are the normal values. After this, you'll go into nursing or respiratory therapy classes or whatever, and then you'll talk about, okay, what happens to these numbers in emphysema? What happens to these numbers in cystic fibrosis? What happens to these numbers in different situations? That's coming for you in the future, but before you can learn about that, you need to learn what's normal. So these numbers are that typical value that we want to think about for normal. Okay, that was, this, the, that was the oxygen numbers. Remind me about CO2. CO2 levels, when you're leaving tissue, you just dropped off oxygen, you just picked up CO2. That millimeter of mercury number should be 45. That 45 then goes to the lung and drops off CO2. After it dropped it off, that number returns back to only 40. It's not a huge difference, is it? That 5 millimeters of mercury is all that's necessary to shift that CO2. So carbon dioxide is being carried in your blood. And that CO2 is picked up by hemoglobin, but CO2 has a few more tricks. What percentage of oxygen did I tell you was dissolved in the plasma itself? Only one and a half percent. Ninety-eight point five percent of all the oxygen being carried through your blood is being carried on the back of hemoglobin. CO2 has a couple more tricks. CO2 always being made but it dissolves more readily. 7% of the CO2 can be dissolved directly into the plasma. So CO2 is more soluble than oxygen. Then about 23% is bound to hemoglobin. Okay. Now oxygen was 98.5% bound to hemoglobin, only about 23 or so percent of CO2 is bound to hemoglobin. That's only 30%, isn't it? The other 70% is actually converted to carbonic acid. Now, where have we seen this carbonic acid before? I gave you this equation. I don't think I said a carbonic acid or I didn't write it out. CO2, when it mixes with water, makes 
carbonic acid, right? Carbonic acid is H2CO3. So a lot of CO2, when it's mixed in your water or plasma, is being converted to this molecule called carbonic acid. So basically, what has the CO2 done? Undergone a chemical change, and it's still being carried through the blood, but as carbonic acid. So 70% is carbonic acid, 23% is sitting on red blood, is sitting on hemoglobin, 7% is dissolved directly in the plasma. When CO2 is bound to hemoglobin, we call it carbaminohemoglobin. Okay. Now, let's take a look. So here is this whole deal. Conversion of CO2 to carbonic acid. It is catalyzed by an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. You might see that just abbreviated CA. So what do we see in the equation? CO2 plus water, arrow. That arrow means a chemical reaction. That arrow is catalyzed by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, and that is forming carbonic acid. 70% of your CO2 is floating through your blood as carbonic acid. But carbonic acid doesn't stay there. It doesn't stay, it's not very stable. So what happens is that carbonic acid molecules dissociate, break apart, recombine to make bicarb, bicarb is HCO3 minus, and H plus. And the bicarb is going to be dealt with through what's called the chloride shift, and hydrogens will bind now to the hemoglobin. So this is always a little bit of a, of a contention. I won't have more than a question, maybe two, on this whole chloride shift idea, because I think it takes um, more of a chemistry background than many of you have, and uh, this just is an area of confusion. So I'll try to minimize it and just show you the picture here in a moment of what's happening. So same when the digestive system makes it. Yeah, it's in the digestive system too, yeah. So what, what do we got? We got plasma. Plasma is the stuff outside of the red blood cells, right? CO2 is coming in, and what do we know? 7% remains dissolved in the plasma. 23% will be bound to the hemoglobin, and 70% will be converted to carbonic anhydrase. That carbonic anhydrase will immediately dissociate, rearrange itself to become bicarb and hydrogen. Okay? So the hydrogen will bind to the hemoglobin, the bicarb will be left out of the cell, and in will come chloride. That's called the chloride shift. It has to be that way, and uh, I'll try to minimize the damage here. We'll come back to that in a minute. When we get back to the alveoli, we'll see how that chloride shift is going to reverse and bring that CO2 back out so we can exhale it. So they use that hydrogen and chloride in the red blood cell when it's not making hydrochloric acid? Yeah. yeah. So, the, so Stacy's question is, how is it? Well, no, here's the deal. You have chloride inside here, right? The, chlor, the chloride ion is inside. The hydrogen, though, is bound to the hemoglobin. Okay. So, so the hydrogen is taken up. It's not available to mix with the H, to make HC. Otherwise, yeah, you'd be making acid, wouldn't you? So we've got to make sure we compartmentalize these things. The hydrogen stays attached to the hemoglobin. The chloride is free. Good catch. The equilibrium of gases, as these gases move, CO2 and O2, in and out of the alveoli and into your hemoglobin and red blood cells, there is an exchange. So we got that, right? We know that oxygen drops off from the alveoli, goes into the tissues, CO2 turns the other way. There is an equilibrium that's kind of established between your alveoli and between the tissues, but that equilibrium is disrupted whenever oxygen demands increase. So you're sitting there, and all of a sudden, you've got to get up and run around, do something that's going to increase the oxygen demands, and it's going to throw this balance off a little bit. So what are you going to do? In order to get up and be active, what do you, how is your body going to adjust? Your, breathe is going to, your, your respiration is definitely going to increase. Your muscles are being used, so your pH would drop. Therefore, your body would drop off more oxygen, says Bohr, right, in the, in the Bohr effect. 
So what happens then is that we're going to be changing our numbers around a little bit. And as you get up and become more active, that's going to lead to, as it says, hypoxia, meaning what? A lack of oxygen in that particular area, wherever part of your body is being used more. And as those muscles and those tissues are being used more, it will cause a drop in your pH levels. So let's take a look at this. This cartoon's nice. So oxygen's coming into the alveolus, and it's dropped over into the red blood cell. 98.5% will be bound to the hemoglobin. A small amount, 1.5%, will be out here in the plasma. Then we're going to take that oxygen and we're going to go to the tissues, and that oxygen is going to drop off and go to the tissues. Let's put our numbers back on this. The oxygen is carrying at what pressure? 95 and dropped off and then became what? 40, right? Those same numbers. Now, what else is happening? This oxygen is going to now, we're going to be picking up CO2. So as we pick up the CO2 coming in, 7% of that CO2 is going to be dissolved in the plasma. 23% is going to be bound to the hemoglobin. And 70% is going to combine with water to make carbonic acid. That carbonic acid will immediately dissociate into H plus and bicarb. That bicarb will be shifted out of the cell. Chloride will be shifted in. And the hydrogens will be found safely bound to the hemoglobin. Then when that blood comes back to the alveolus, what do we got to do? Get that CO2 out. But something has to happen in order for that to happen. We have to recover. Remember, 70% of the CO2 is masquerading as bicarb slash bicarbonate or, or carbonic acid. So we have to get that CO2 back. So we have to do the opposite. Up here, chlorine is now going to come out. The bicarb is going to come in. That's going to reconstitute the carbonic acid, which is then going to shift off the water and create more CO2. So it's, blown, it's going to be able to blow off. All this is is, all this is is a magic trick. That's all it is. How is the body going to carry all that CO2 back from the tissues? It's going to masquerade it, carry it, magic trick it, whatever, into carbonic acid. That carbonic acid is going to be carried through the blood, the blue blood, back to the lungs, and then we have to do hocus pocus again. And we got to convert that carbonic acid and bicarb back to CO2. That's all this is. Don't make it harder. It's simply that chlorine is that hocus pocus movement that's going to allow the conversion of the acid back to the CO2. So when the chloride is taken on and the bicarb is pushed out of the red blood cell, yes. it's still traveling in the bloodstream along yeah, so with Yes, so this, this chlorine and bicarb is in the bloodstream. bloodstream. Okay. It's there all along. It's not left back. It's no, it's, it's still in the plasma. It's dissolved. Okay. And bicarb is basically baking soda. Right? Sodium bicarbonate. It is the bicarb is just baking soda and it helps to neutralize. I haven't gone there yet, but that bicarb that's floating in your blood is actually helping to is helping to increase the pH, fight off pH changes. It's part of your buffering system. So the ability of your blood to maintain that 7.4 is in part built into this bicarb that is floating in your blood all the time. So that's a nice little table to take a look at. I have time to show this video. So let's see if we can put all this together. If it's going to play. Let's see if it's going to play for me. It may not play. Let me see if I can get it. I'll play, get it to play here. should be OK. There we go. You need to breathe in oxygen to help you get energy. And breathe out carbon dioxide, a waste product.
When you inhale, your diaphragm and rib muscles contract, increasing the volume of your lungs. When you exhale, these muscles relax, decreasing the volume of the lungs. When the lungs expand, air pressure in the lungs drops. Just did that, that was my bad. Whether you're racing in a triathlon or doing something less strenuous, you need to breathe in oxygen to help you get energy. <coughs> and breathe out carbon dioxide, a waste product. This video would be available in your study area. You want to watch it again. And on your PowerPoint. When you inhale, your diaphragm and rib muscles contract, increasing the volume of your lungs. When you exhale, these muscles relax decreasing the volume of the lungs. When the lungs expand, air pressure in the lungs drops, causing air to flow into the lungs. When lung volume decreases, air pressure increases, causing air to flow out of the lungs. Air enters the nose or mouth, moves down the trachea, and goes into the two bronchi. Air moves down smaller and smaller bronchioles until it reaches a tiny sac, an alveolus. Each alveolus is surrounded by capillaries. Oxygen diffuses from the alveolus to the blood and carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood to the alveolus. As blood flows through the capillary, it becomes rich in oxygen. In the blood, oxygen diffuses into a red blood cell and binds to hemoglobin, a protein made up of four subunits. One oxygen molecule can bind to each subunit. Oxygen-rich blood flows from the lungs to the heart. Which pumps this blood to capillaries all over the body. Here, we see oxygen diffusing from a capillary's red blood cells into a muscle cell. Oxygen is used by the cell's mitochondria to produce ATP during cellular respiration. Carbon dioxide is released. How does carbon dioxide leave the body? Carbon dioxide diffuses from cells into capillaries. Some carbon dioxide stays in the plasma, the liquid part of the blood. Most carbon dioxide, however, enters red blood cells. Some carbon dioxide binds to hemoglobin. 23%. The rest is converted to bicarbonate, which diffuses into the plasma. This oxygen-poor blood flows back to the heart, which pumps it to the lungs. There, Carbon dioxide diffuses from the plasma into the alveolus. Bicarbonate enters red blood cells and is converted back to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is also released from hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide diffuses out of the red blood cells into the plasma and into the alveolus. When you exhale, Air flows out of your lungs. And that's how you release carbon dioxide, get oxygen, and keep on running. And what were the numbers? When the, what's the pressure? The millimeters of mercury of CO2 coming back from the tissue to the lung? 45. And will dump into the alveolus because there it's only 40. Okay. So is it all starting to come together? That, that chloride shift, just think of it as a, as a magician's hocus-pocus wand. And that is what's going to convert that CO2 from carbonic acid back and forth.
Okay. Now, um, I mentioned a little bit of this in lab, and I'll mention this again for those who are in lab this week. The compliance, it's not a word I use today, but compliance is basically how able, how willing, how easily your lungs will expand. Young lungs are wonderfully compliant. If your children are compliant, it means what? They do what they're supposed to do, right? So when your lungs are young and healthy, they do what they're supposed to do. That is, they are supposed to be very elastic, very stretchy, and open up as needed. As we get older, though, our lungs become less compliant. They basically stop being quite as stretchy, and they no longer can expand as fully. Now, we know that as you expand the thoracic cavity, the lungs, if they are fully compliant, will go along with them and expand as needed. And over time, like I said, this will decrease. Now, if your lungs cannot, if your lungs aren't compliant, then what's, gonna, what's not going to happen? If you're not able to stretch and open up your lungs, that means you can't increase the volume of your lungs. If you can't increase the volume of your lungs, then you cannot decrease the pressure adequately to allow external ventilation to occur. So the, not as much air will come rushing into your lungs if they are not as compliant. So compliancy is an important issue in respiratory diseases. So here we see, you know, have you ever had a balloon that blows up really easy? Right? Boop, one breath, no problem. That would be a very compliant balloon. Have you ever had a balloon that, darn it, it's like I can't get any air in that thing. The thing won't expand. That's an old person's lung, right? Or a person with fibrosis or some sort of condition where the compliancy of the lung decreases. It just takes a whole lot more work for that lung to expand. Makes sense, right? Now, we're going to be talking about in lab two different groups of conditions. We'll talk about restrictive disorders. And in restrictive disorders, a way of imagining it is taking 10 bungee cords and wrapping them tightly around your chest. And you can imagine how difficult it would now be to breathe. And therefore, the, the, uh, the compliance of the lung would be tremendously affected. So in that analogy of putting bungee cords around the chest, the problem there is in the, is in the chest. But I want you to imagine the problem isn't in the muscles of the chest, but some of the problems in the lung. And it cannot expand as it should. So this resistance is very, very important. Um, the muscular activity involved in breathing accounts for about 3 to 5% of your resting energy. It's not huge, right? As you sit there and watch TV, 3, 5, three to 5% of your energy is going into breathing. Increased resistance, right? If your lungs are not compliant, what must your muscles do? Work harder. And with that increased workload, that is going to increase the energy necessary and therefore the percentage of your energy going into breathing. A person who has a respiratory condition is worn out just by having to breathe. Right? A person who has asthma, they're putting not 3 to 5% of their energy into breathing, but they're putting a larger, much larger percentage of their overall energy just into the act of breathing. And so these folks are really tired, right? They're tired. It's a lot more work to do breathing for individuals with a respiratory dis disorder. So this is referring to resistance. That balloon that blows up easily has great compliance and has increased resistance. It's just not expanding as it should. So compliance and resistance are inversely related, right? You're resisting it. You have decreased compliance. Now, in lab and today, I'm going to talk about two groups of disorders. One are the obstructive pulmonary disorders. The most commonly heard of disease, well, there's actually a couple of them. Uh, within this, we can't turn on the TV without hearing about COPD and Spireva and the elephant on my chest and I can't breathe commercials. And COPD actually chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. There's some chronic condition that's leading to that COPD. Under COPD can come asthma. In lab, I had them as two separate things. But asthma is a type of COPD. It's a chronic obstructive disorder. These disorders 
to allow to imagine them would be like trying to breathe in and out through a straw. Right? You've got just a straw. You, you're, you're not able to get as much air in. You're not able to get much air out. The obstruction is occurring. The airway is more narrow. In an asthmatic, right, there's something that's squeezing down on the muscles of the bronchioles. In a person with um, any kind of bronchitis, then there's fluid and inflammation of the bronchioles, and that's making this straw-like breathing necessary. So you've got a lot of irritation, a lot of swelling in those muscles. Remember, please, that the trachea is characterized by rings of cartilage, those C rings. As you go down into the primary bronchi, those rings become a little bit less consistent. As you go down to the secondary tertiary bronchi, they become less and less. And by the time you get to the bronchioles, there's essentially no more cartilage. Now those tubes are held open exclusively by smooth muscle. And that's where the problem can come in, in the irritation of COPD type conditions. Asthma can be triggered by allergens, an allergic response, by cold air, by exercise, by all sorts of things. Or these individuals can have sort of a chronic obstructive disorder. How In addition, exercise irritate the bronchial. so you're expecting them to do something, aren't you? So in, in smooth muscle exercise, what do we know about smooth muscle? Usually when it stretches, it will, it will allow that. But in exercise-induced asthma, that increased bronchial dilation, the muscles kind of kick back at that for reasons we don't think we completely understand. But as a result of being asked to stretch, they kind of close back down. Sort of like, yeah, I mean, it's sort of almost like a peristalsis of your stomach, right? You stretch your stomach and all of a sudden now the stomach is going to squeeze and push the digestive products through. Same idea. So in, as in exercise-induced asthma, it's something about the increased dilation of the smooth muscles of the bronchioles is abnormally causes a restriction in the flow. Now, in addition to asthma, there's also chronic bronchitis. So this would be a long-term, ongoing swelling irritation of the lining and also an increase in mucus. So that increase in mucus, mm, I don't know how mucus and straws go together, right? But imagine you're right, you're, that, that mucus is actually going to be filling up the bronchioles, isn't it? And as a result, it's going to narrow the, the, the lumen of the vessels. And so it's the same idea. And these folks are always coughing. If you really like working with, you know, if you want to be a respiratory therapist, you must be able to handle gagging and coughing and, you know, the classic, this is really horrible, stereotypic, but to work at the VA is to work with a lot of really old men who are coughing up sputum all the time, right? A lot of, a lot of people with a lot of his, history of smoking. So the number one thing here is smoking. That's the big thing. And that extra irritation can lead to increased infection. So these folks also have a lot of pneumonia, right? So the, that chronic bronchitis will, once a year or whatever, they'll be in the hospital because they've got a significant case of pneumonia. And this is something that happens uh, as smokers uh, progress through their, their, uh, their addiction, I guess you want to say. Um, now, what happens is that, that chronic bronchitis can also lead to edema and low oxygen levels, and people here, people with chronic uh, bronchitis are also oftentimes called the blue bloaters, right? Blue bloaters, blue because their tissues are not getting the oxygen they need, so they're kind of blue. Bloaters because they have this inflammation around their um, heart as a result. It's not chronic. That's an acute bronchitis, and that's a different situation, okay? So just a, a normal lung infection, I got a little, you know, uh, chest cold, that's not, a, that's not chronic, right? That's an acute, it clears, everything's back to normal. Then lastly, under this. Now, I've, I've got to put a little bit of, a, of an addendum on this. Emphysema is listed under COP uh, conditions, and, and this is true, but emphysema is a little bit more complicated than this. Uh, it is a chronic, it is a progressive disease. In lab last week, you quickly saw what the 
emphysema lung looks like. And what you noted, I hope, or what I hope I helped you note, is that the alveoli size becomes enlarged. And because of that, there's less surface area for gas exchange. But the other thing that happens in emphysema is that the lung loses its elastic tissue. Okay? It doesn't recoil back. And in that regard, emphysema is sort of like a fibrotic disease. So there's really two things going on in emphysema. Emphysema is really a combination of an obstructive disorder and what I'm going to talk about next, restrictive disorders. It really is a blending of the two. So not only can they, um, do they have issues with getting air in, but they also have issues with getting air out, okay, because they lose that compliance, that elasticity of the lungs. These are pink puffers, okay? And here's the deal. If you have emphysema, then you need to breathe far more often, okay? You are going to be very often, but more shallow breaths. You've got to increase that respiratory rate to try to keep the oxygen going. And this exaggerated uh, breathing will help maintain the oxygenation levels near normal until they need to do any kind of exercise. And then at that point, they can't really do much of anything as this condition um, progresses. So pink because they're kind of normal in color. Puffers because they're breathing so fast. So pink puffers versus the blue bloaters. Last few things here. Um, any questions on, on the diseases? I, I'm going to mention, I'm going to mention, Yeah, okay, so restrictive disorders is not in here. I need to add that just as a note, okay? Um, just because I need to be complete with what's going on in lab. So these are all obstructive disorders. There are also restrictive disorders. Restrictive disorders, and in lab I'll talk about this, but the number one restrictive disorder is pulmonary Fibrosis. Now, pulmonary fibrosis is where the lung, for reasons we do not understand, we think it might be a viral infection, we don't know all of it, but the lung becomes extremely fibrotic. It becomes very, very stiff. It loses its compliance almost completely, and it becomes very, very rigid. Okay, so the resistance increases, the compliance crashes, and basically, no matter how hard one tries to breathe and increase their thoracic cavity, the lungs will not expand. The, the clinical way of thinking about this, for an obstructive disorder, you imagine blowing through a straw. For a restrictive disorder, you want to imagine that you've got 10 bungee cords around your chest and you can't breathe, right? You just can't expand your chest. It's that hard. So a person with a fibrotic disease would be what? Spending a lot of energy trying to get their lungs to expand, but without much success. And they eventually die um, of asphyxiation. They, their body just simply is not getting the oxygen that it needs. I want to just mention that there because we will talk about restrictive disorders in the lab. I wanted to make that story complete. For like a fibrotic disease like that, would they be like eligible to be on a transplant? List, yes, yes, yes. And in fact, sometimes um, if they can get it early enough, I've known people who have been diagnosed with fibrosis and are dead within a year. It can be a very rapid progression that is just, it's a hideous disease. It really, really is. But it's very rapid sometimes. And we don't understand what causes it. People would, they're not, they're not necessarily smokers. The smokers are not higher I don't think they're higher for fibrosis. Emphysema, bron uh, chronic bronchitis, COPD, yes. Uh, fibrosis, I don't know the etiology. It just kind of comes on. We don't really know what's going on. So I'm thinking it might be a viral infection that attacks the lung. So you know that the heart is autorhythmic. That means it has a pacemaker that is set off in the SA node. You know that smooth muscle had pace setter cells. Also, smooth muscle could sort of self auto-regulate. The lungs do not have a pacemaker within themselves, but there is a part of the brain stem called the respiratory rhythmicity center. 
And basically, this is in the medulla oblongata, and this is where there are signals that are going to tell you to breathe. We know we don't have to think about breathing. Do we have some control over it? Yeah, even more so than the heart, right? We can, we can say, okay, I want to breathe in more deeply. I want to try to relax my breathing. We have some control over it, but the brain, specifically the medulla oblongata in the brainstem, is going to be setting the pace of your respiratory system. And um, that's going to keep things going when you're breathing. There are also uh, a complex, basically, uh, um, let me just skip over that, that um, Boltzinger complex for a second and just get to the picture of the brain. In fact, I'm just going to have you cross that off because I don't think, I'm not going to have time to get into this too much. So don't worry about the, the complex. Let's go to the brain. And here there are a couple of regions, the dorsal respiratory group, the DRG. This is going to respond from chemo and baroreceptors. Chemoreceptors are found in your blood. They are found in your CSF. They're measuring the pH of your blood. And baroreceptors are measuring the stretch of your lungs. <coughs> Sounds a lot like the heart, right? Remember the heart had baroreceptors and chemoreceptors. Except here we're talking about not the heart rate, but the respiratory rate. And if your pH, let's think about this, if the pH is going down, what are those chemoreceptors going to tell the body, tell the lungs to do? Breathe faster, right? Because if the pH is going down, you've got too much CO2 accumulating. So what's the body want to do? Get rid of that CO2 and bring in new oxygen. That's going to require a faster respiratory rate. Baroreceptors, we don't want our lungs to have to expand too much, so there is sort of a, a checks and balances going on with the stretching of the lungs. This DRG is mainly concerned with inspiration, right? How often you're going to breathe in. Then there's the VRG, the ventral respiratory group. The name dorsal and ventral is simply where it's found in the medulla. And this group is mostly involved with expiration. It really only kicks in when your breathing must be involving the accessory muscles, when your breathing goes beyond normal tidal volume, resting, quiet breathing. There's also, in addition to the DRG and the VRG, in the pons, there's also another respiratory rhythmicity center and this one is going to help adjust the pace. So the other two are going to initiate, and this one is going to be adjusting that pace. And then there's also uh, an apneustic center. This is going to promote inhalation by stimulating the DRG. So let's put this all together in a picture. Um, but before we get that, though, there's also new, uh, pneumotaxic centers. And these are going to inhibit uh, apneustic center. So basically, these are going to promote exhalation. In other words, you've got a couple places of, of regulation going on here for breathing. In addition, that's all happening. Do you agree? That's your brainstem. That's your medulla and your pons. But you also have control, limited control, over your breathing. So you do have some control over your breathing coming down from your cerebral cortex, from your limbic system. When you hear the word limbic system, you think what? Emotions. If you're scared, what happens? Heart rate goes up, right? If you're thinking more pleasant things, then your heart rate goes and your breathing rate goes down. So let's put this into a picture. Okay? So number one, these are the respiratory rhythmicity centers. They are in the Again, I told you not to worry about the, the, the pre-complex, but there's the DRG and the, and the VRG. These are involved with breathing, basic breathing. The DRG was initiating the diaphragm. The VRG was more about accessory centers. In addition, up in the ponds, there are also centers that are involved with your breathing. And of course, you have the ability with your cerebral cortex to also control breathing. So how does this work? 
when you are in quiet breathing. Typically, again, what was the average number of breaths per minute? 12 or so, right? 12, what did I say? 12 to 18. Here I'm showing you a five second cycle. All right, so this would be a breathing rate of what? 12. So in a normal five second breathing cycle, you would be in normal quiet breathing, you would be breathing in for about two seconds. So you're inhaling for two seconds and you're exhaling actually for more time. As you do this, right, as you inhale the diaphragm, the external intercostals are contracting, then the neurons in the DRG will become inactive and they will remain quiet for about three seconds or so and then the muscles will relax and then we go through this cycle again. So the DRG is driving this whole thing. It's driving your quiet breathing. During forced breathing, you're now going to stimulate not only the DRG, but the DRG is now going to stimulate the V, sorry, the VRG, the VRG is always going to be increasing your accessory muscles. You're going to increase your breathing beyond what you normally would. And also the VRG and the DRG will be um, inactivated. And we just go around in cycles on this. So just know the DRG is your quiet breathing. The VRG is more the accessory forced breathing cycles. So there are respiratory reflexes. If you breathe in smoke, if you breathe in cold air, you might cough, you might choke, right? There might be something that in causes you to, to get rid of that. There can also be chemoreceptors and baroreceptors that are also responding. So your reflexes, your respiratory reflexes are simply how likely are you to cough to try to get rid of some sort of stimulant or how is your body going to re respond to the demands of every day? Last couple things on the chemo and baroreceptors. And I think that's going to be how far I get. Let me just check that. Yep, we just got the receptors to go to and then what happens with aging, so we've got this. Um, so chemo receptors. I alluded to them. What do we know? Under normal PCO2, in your blood, what is normal PCO2? In venous blood, it's 45. In arterial blood, it's 40. It only takes a small change in your PCO2 to double your respiratory rate. A rise of 10% arterial CO2 will double your respiratory rate. What does that mean? What's your normal arterial CO2, PCO2? 40. 40. 10%. 44, right? That's going to double your respiratory rate. Why? What's going to happen? If you double your PCO2, it's going to increase your respiratory rate because what's it basically saying? If you've got more CO2, you have less oxygen, right? So basically... What we're saying is if you play around with the oxygen levels, your body's going to respond very, very quickly. PO2 levels that drop below 60 will also trigger the respiratory center. What is your oxygen normally? 95, going to the tissues, and if it's under 60, it's going to trigger your respiratory centers. Basically, what does that mean? It means you can't hold your breath too long. You can try, right? You can hold your breath. And your, PC, your PO2 is dropping 95, 75, right? Time's going on. When your PO2 drops below 60, then you're going to trigger your respiratory centers. And what are those respiratory centers going to tell you to do? Breathe dummy. And hopefully you're above water when that happens. Because you can only hold your breath so long. Until such time, your brain says involuntarily, Breathe, dummy. Right? And that's all has to do with these chemoreceptors. So as the CO2 levels are dropping, sorry, PCO2 is increasing, and PO2 levels are dropping as you're holding your breath, 
at some point these automatic reflexes will kick in. Now what about hypercapnia? Hypercapnia, what does that mean? Hypermore, cap is referring to CO2. So this is a situation where you have too much CO2 in your arterial blood. What would you say happens? Too much CO2. What's going to happen? It's going to increase those chemoreceptors. Your body is going to respond by increasing your respiratory rate. What would cause this? Why would your pCO2 levels increase? Most commonly caused by hypoventilation. You're just not getting the air in, right? Uh, maybe there's a disease state or you're just not getting the ventilation into your body, right? So your oxygen levels are going down, your CO2 levels are rising. We call it hypercapnia, hypercapnia. How about hypocapnia? Not enough CO2. This is most commonly caused by hyperventilation. So what happens here? In response to low CO2, the body will decrease the respiratory rate, okay? And this happens to snorkelers sometimes. Um, and um, this can be dangerous, again, because of that CO2 level rising and some issues that happen. But you can actually have this shallow water blackout where people will try to breathe um, as a result of this, and they're not quite up to level. So take a look at this graph. I think this makes good, good sense. Hypercapnia, hypocapnia, increased and decreased levels of CO2 in the arterial blood. And what would the results be? What would your body do under high CO2 and high O2 levels? In addition to the chemoreceptors that are checking out the pH of your blood, and therefore the amount of CO2, you also have baroreceptors. These are checking your blood pressure. You already know about these. These are checking your blood pressure at the carotid and aortic sinuses. These are not only going to change your heart rate, but they're also going to change your respiratory rate. If there was a drop in your blood pressure, that's going to stimulate your respiratory centers and cause you to breathe deeper and more often. If instead there was an increase in your blood pressure, it's going to inhibit that. Okay, so there's a, there's a connection here between your baroreceptors, your heart, and your lung responses, as is shown here in this diagram. I am out of time. I'm just going to look ahead and remind myself of what I did not get a chance to mention. And there's just a little bit of here about, okay, just the muscles and the DRG and the VRG. And the last thing was what happens with aging, and it shows a graph of a typical smoker versus a person who never smoked, and the fact that if you stop smoking after a number of years, it does slow down the decline of respiratory function. It doesn't recover, but it does slow down and, and uh, minimize the danger. And as we finish up, it mentions lung cancer being affected mostly by smoking. So we pretty much finished everything in that. Um, on Thursday, make sure before I see you again that you have um, gone through the three quizzes, lymphatic, digestive, and respiratory. And I know that as you go through the quiz, they will help put this information together. The thing that people struggle with on this test are those numbers. So make sure you know those 40, 45 numbers are related to CO2 and the 95 and 40 numbers related to the oxygen.